are back, and uh, it's good to be back. Uh, fortunately, nobody appear, apparently nobody's died in the last <laughs> few weeks, have they, Tim? <laughs> yeah, which is, you know, I, I, this is great. Uh, <laughs> that, 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 that nobody famous uh, died. I think Harrison Ford jacked himself up uh, out oh, there on the did. set of something. Uh, yeah. dude, hey, look, Harrison, love you, baby. He's damn near 80 if he's not already 80. Love you. Uh, uh, let the stunt people do it, man. Uh, and and did you love saying? We got it. You're, 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 you're the man. Temple of Doom. Yes. Temple of Doom, too. Yes. Like, 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 I think a third of his action scenes in Temple of Doom, if not more than that, Temple of Doom, are are the, the stunt double, uh, which is what it should have been in the first place. Yeah. Dude, let him do it, Harrison. It's all right, baby. We want to keep you around a little bit longer. you got to freaking kill yourself. Stop it. Uh, I think Tom needs to get the hell over that, too. Cruz. Cruz. Yeah. Yeah, all right, Tommy. It's been, it's been, we got it. You're a badass. You're, <laughs> no, you're <laughs> Even Jackie Chan does. Yeah, do you can't make that jump anymore, man. No. You can't make that jump. It's no. okay. Ain't nobody mad at you, uh, but you know. And in fact, little known story uh, is that the big jump in Rumble in the Bronx, which is when still Jackie was in his prime, but the big jump from like uh, from balcony to balcony across the uh, that that alley. Oh. Um, that's not Jackie in the final film. Uh, <laughs> that is that is that is Stanley Tong, the director, <laughs> and it, and it doing it. That, that, how weird is that? The director is doing the stunt because Jackie did it once, almost broke his ankle doing it, and was terrified to do it again. And Stanley said, "Well, damn it all, that I'll." Go do it. <laughs> Stanley went and did it. You know what, Stanley? Good for you. <laughs> and, and the crazy thing is, they still had a stunt team. So when the, st- the stunt team is sitting there watching the star do it and get scared, and then the director does it. Well, what, what are the stunt guys doing? Why They're sitting around going, why are we even here? Uh, why are we even here? Oh, the, director, the director and the star are like getting into this. Okay, whatever. You guys knock yourselves out. Look, there was, there was a moment when that was extremely impressive and, you know, and all yeah. that. And I would, but yeah. you know what? It's okay, guys. It's all CGI now. Cut it out. It's <laughs> crazy. Well, so we, uh, we've got, you know, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start off uh, with MOD. We've got a bunch of MOD stuff from a lot of companies that do have great titles on MOD. And uh, uh, Tim does not know what I'm going to get through here. So I'm going to let <laughs> Tim weigh in with his uh, outstanding film history wisdom oh, and boy. tell me which, if any of these, uh, we, we, you, should, uh, you should watch. The, the, now, before I get into that, this is kind of a little, I just want to preface it with three titles, all of which are really recommended, but only for silent film fans. There is, uh, this is all from Flickr Alley, all on MOD, all, all Blu-ray. Uh, Laurel or Hardy, the early solo films of Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, which is great because, you know, they did a thing before they teamed up and, mm. and there's some really, really fun, very obscure, um, uh, kind of cool one reelers and, and, uh, and whatnot here. The, uh, they, they break, broken down Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy plus bonus material, uh, cool little booklet. Then there is also, uh, Clara Bow and Gary Cooper. Oh, wow. In Children of Divorce, which is amazing. Gary Cooper, before he revealed that amazing voice, was not a bad silent uh, actor. Uh, this is from 1927, right on the cusp. 71 very, very short, brisk minutes. Clara Bow, of course, didn't really make the transition to sound, but Gary mm-hmm. Cooper did. And that's what makes this interesting is that, you know, the actress uh, really hit her heyday in silent and the actor is about to become the biggest thing ever in the in the sound era. And then lastly, uh, the original uh, 1927 Chicago, which, oh. uh, yeah, I, everybody kind of forgets that it was it was a it was a silent film, you know, originally. And uh, it also has the Golden Twenties on here. So each, you know, Chicago is about two hours long, just under. And the Golden Twenties is about an hour. So you get a nice little uh, double feature. But it's cool looking at the silent version of it. Roxy Hart and all that stuff, and uh, comparing it to the musical, so it's all very cool. Mm, yeah, so that, all that, that, that Renee Zell, that's dude, that was that's almost twenty years. Stop ago. it! Stop it! Don't don't do that to me. <laughs> don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. I do not want to hear it. it I do not want to. Hear it. I will wait until next year when they have the uh, the like uh, the anniversary. <laughs> the anniversary. That, uh, I don't want to know about. <laughs> all right. Uh, so here we go. We are going to start off with uh, the Paramount titles. Here we go. Here we go, Tim. This is all MOD from Paramount. Oh my. Okay. And it's funny because I requested a, uh, Eye for an Eye, and I thought I so want to see that Chuck Norris movie again. No, not that eye for an eye. It's not the Chuck Norris eye for an eye. This is eye for an eye with uh, Sally Field, Kiefer Sutherland, and Ed Harris. Oh, my. So we've got that. We have uh, We're No Angels with Humphrey Bogart and Peter Ustinov. 
Michael Curtiz directing. They remade that in the eighties too, I think, with uh, Sean Penn. I think they did. And, Sean Penn, uh, yeah, 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 yeah sure somebody. Yeah, yeah. So, so all right, I for an eye sat with uh, Sally Field. Uh, We're no angels. Humphrey Bogart, Peter Ustinov, Lady Sings the Blues. Uh, Diana Ross is Billie Holiday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got a John Hughes five movie collection with Plain Strains and Automobiles, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. She's having a baby. Pretty in Pink and some kind of wonderful. We have a Girls Rule collection, Mean Girls, Clueless, and She's the Man with Amanda Bynes. Oh, wow. Yeah. We have Chris Rock and Bernie Mac in Head of State, a little bit before it's time in a weird way. We have Greg Kinnear in Dear God. Oh, wow. Uh, right. And uh, we have Dead Man on Campus. I'd totally forgotten this thing even existed. Dead Man on Campus with... Uh, uh, who the hell was in this? Mark Paul Gosler and Tom Everett Scott. We have the Louis C.K. written and directed Pootie Pang. We, we have a, a movie that I am greatly fond of. The Reginald Hudlin directed The Ladies' Man. Oh, yeah. Uh, with uh, taking off on the, uh, the, the Tim yes, Meadows character SNL, from yeah. SNL. Cheech and Chong and Still Smoking. <laughs> and then the naked gun the naked gun two and a half the smell of fear and the naked gun 33 and a third the final insult Tim, uh, is there anything there that people should go out and order well look i know that it's a little bit controversial to say but those john hughes films are still near and dear to my heart just about all of them right uh you know it, 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 the films live in the period from which they come from so um, um uh, i believe one of them is some kind of wonderful uh, if i'm not yeah. mistaken Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. did you say you had like a five pack? What, 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 it's what, a five pack. It's plain strains and automobiles. Mm, Bueller, she's mm. having a baby, pretty in pink, and some kind of wonderful. And they're just and, and those the films are just wonderful. Uh, particularly Ferris Bueller. Can't go wrong with Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh, so but cool. dude, Eye for an Eye. That's a John Schlesinger film. Eye like, for that, an Eye. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that's the, that's the uh, that Sally Field film. That that film was actually that film was actually pretty damn good. The Sally Field Keither. Kiefer Sutherland, Ed Harris running around in that movie. That was not a bad, tight little uh, little movie back when uh, Sally Phil was kind of kind of like all that. I, uh, I have a confession. I don't even remember this movie. Yeah. I, I, and I and I would have remembered like a John Schlesinger movie. Like I even remember when uh, the thing he did with Martin Sheen and the Voodoo, whatever that was. <laughs> the, the, oh you know, yeah. I, Remember that? Like, I remember all these John Schlesinger movies. I looked at this. I just thought, I don't even remember this. Like, when I saw Eye for an Eye, the Chuck Norris movie is actually the one that takes place in Hong Kong where mm -hmm. he goes mano a mano with, with uh, Professor Tanaka. So I was wrong on all kinds of levels when I was thinking of this, you know. So I, I you know, I was messed up. But anyway. yeah, no, it's, anyway. uh, Amanda Silver uh, wrote that screen, but it's all Amanda Silver. Yeah. And, and there were a few others in there that I thought were just kind of interesting. Uh, naked, gun, uh, naked gun movies. Naked gun movies. Can't I mean, go wrong with I, the naked gun I, movies. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, pretty well. Leslie is sort of reinventing himself. People forget he had been like a serious dramatic actor. Yeah, uh, you know, in the fifties, and and then you know, and for 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 a while, they entered the seventies television, all that kind of stuff, and and sort of reinvented himself. Uh, and 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 well, I guess beginning with what I guess it would have been with uh, airplane, the first one. Yeah. Which was the first one? He was in that it was one. An, right? It was airplane. That was it. Uh, that was the so, one. Yeah, guys, he played the doctor in that, and sort of reinvented himself, and then just had another whole third act to his career doing those goofy ass movies, and they were funny. How do we feel about Pootie Tang in hindsight? Pootie Tang, look, um, uh, Louis C.K. This, this yeah. is the interesting thing about Pootie, K, Pootie Tang. Think about Pootie Tang. We think about Louis. Uh, we even think about Chris Rock because Chris Rock is, is, is in Pootie it, Tang. It, it was originally a sketch on, on his show. Well, it's this yeah. whole thing uh, uh, there. But Pootie Tang itself, hold on. What, the guy that plays Pootie Tang, his name is Lance Carruthers or something. Lance like that. Crowther, yeah. Crowther. What, hap what happened to him? Lance is, well, first of all, Lance goes all the way back to the early days of the sort of like, uh, uh, let's say the, the, the post Richard prior early comedy scene. Lance is a comedian and a comedy writer. He can go, go, go all the way back to comic justice, early 1990s, right? And all of the black comics uh, that came out of that scene, including Chris and uh, and Dave Chappelle and all of these those cats, Lance wrote for all of those people. Wow. And he wrote for every one of those television shows. He wrote for the Chris Rock show. I mean, like, you know, the, uh, Everybody Hates Chris, I think was the name of that right, show. Right, the, right, right. All of those things forever, forever. Uh, all, so that's where he goes back. This is why all these guys, 
know him and knew him. And this was, you know, uh, Louis C.K. wrote this piece and, you know, and Lance had been, and he put him in this piece. And it's a wacky, wacky movie that I think is going to eventually one day be one of those sort of cult classics. It's not quite there yet, but it's well on its way. Well, that, that, that would be very sweet. Um, I, I, look, I know Ladies' Man will never be a cult classic, but I freaking love this I love that movie. I really do. I mean, I love the character. I love the bits on SNL. But what's smart about this uh, is is that, that they don't ask Tim Meadows to carry the whole movie, to do anything that he wasn't already doing. They, he's basically doing the sketch, the Covassier, the whole thing and all that. And Will Ferrell should really only do cameos. Yeah. I, I hate to say that, but when Will Ferrell shows up in Wedding Crashers, mom, more meatloaf. <laughs> he steals the movie. Yeah. That's all we need of him. Little yeah. small doses. When he shows up in here and starts talking about, you know, hot oil wrestling other men. <laughs> it's really funny. And it's all you need. It's just small doses. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. am a fan of ladies, man. Um, let, let's talk about the two the two uh, older ones here for a second. Lady Sings the Blues and We're No Angels. I mean, We're No Angels. I keep forgetting that this even exists. It's it's not top tier uh, Paramount picture from the time, but it's fine. It's got, you know, Basil Rathbone shows up. Michael Curtiz does a good job. I think, you know, it's a lighter side of, uh, of Humphrey Bogart that you don't often see. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think it was, I think it was, uh, I think it was. It was uh, Sean Penn and I want to say De Niro that did one in the 80s. Yeah, did, did we yeah know you're was right. De Niro? That's, That's a it. weird, weird sort of thing. And of course, Lady Sings the Blues. Now, here we have Richard Pryor again. <coughs> uh, uh, well, obviously, Lady Sings the Blues, the wonderful Diana Ross playing Billy uh-huh. Holiday. We have Billy Williams. This is, a, you know, in the black community, this is, this is a, a phenomenal it's, it's classic a great film. Movie. Uh, yeah. But it was one of those moments where, where um, you know, youngish Richard Pryor, um, who had been in movies before, um, uh, Stoller really wants to show his chops. He's, and he's funny in that movie, but man, he has a absolutely heartbreaking scene in that movie. He's the piano player guy. And he, uh, you know, it doesn't go well for him. And Richard plays yeah. this, this death scene. Oh my gosh. It's, it's absolutely great fantastic. It's great He's amazing. Scene. He's amazing in that scene and in that movie. So yeah, ladies sings the blues. Of course, uh, what was it? I guess it was, it would have been last award season. We had Andre yeah. Day, uh, yeah. young, young, young actress nominated for playing. Uh, Billie Holiday uh, at a certain period in her life. And she was really, really wonderful. But Billy, but uh, Diana Ross, young Diana Ross had yeah. to inhabit, uh, you know, that, that span of Billie Holiday's life in that movie. And she, and she, and she really killed it. And she did all her own singing too. We've also got a couple of Paramount pictures here uh, that are part of their, their Paramount select library or the Paramount presents, I should say Paramount presents, which is a Jan de uh, remake of the haunting, which I'm not overly fond of, uh, but you know, some people tend to be fans of it. So that's, that's there. And then also um, the Vista vision last train from gun Hill with Kirk Douglas and Anthony Mm. Quinn, which is a really pretty terrific old Western looks beautiful here. I would love a 4k of this, uh, but the Vista vision on this Blu-ray is just really lovingly mastered. They did a great job, top notch. And uh, Kirk Douglas Westerns, you can do no wrong. No. Uh, with Anthony Quinn. You're, Sturgis. You're there. Sturgis, yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's go, let's go to some Sony titles here. Uh, here's some Sony MOD titles. Uh, we got Sally Field again and Tom Hanks and Punchline. Oh, you know, I like that movie a lot more than some people. It's really funny. Sally, Sally Field playing the sort of like everyday housewife, married to John Goodman, and, you know, got the kids, the whole thing. But at night, she goes out and does uh, stand up. Stand up. Uh, Tom Hanks playing this doctor. He might be in medical school, but I think he's a young doctor. And, uh, and at night, he goes out and does stand up. I think Mark Rydell, uh, in that film, directed it too. Is that a Mark uh, Rydell film? Mark, no, it's not. It's a David Seltzer film. David Seltzer Mark, film. But yeah. Mark Rydell is in it he's in it yeah he the guy. It, so. there's a period when stand-up was just this thing uh yeah. there and uh what's funny about that movie is how funny the jokes that sally feel tell sally feels tells she's, she's you know because she's doing these jokes and she's buying jokes from these sort of like old school cat skill type cats and yeah. diners <laughs> you know writing jokes on napkins <laughs> and it's just i don't know it just uh, it's a it's a movie that worked for me back in the day i don't think it was a big hit but i loved it what about fun with Dick and Jane, George Siegel and Jane Fonda from mm. uh, what, what year? What year was it? 1975? Yeah, yeah, 1975. You know, there was a there was a moment when when these sort of sophisticated movies, they remade that movie, too. I think with Jim yeah. Carrey and Tealia. Uh, not so good. But but this one, um, there was a moment when these sort of sophisticated movies 
were the thing, uh, you know, and, 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 and they were about, you know, uh, middle class people living their lives, doing stuff. And it was just it, it was, these were really, really good movies. And I really love that movie. Fun with Dick and Jane. Uh, you know, really interesting bunch of people who wrote the screenplay. David Geiler, Jerry Belson, who, by the way, had a hand in Close Encounters. People mm. forget that. And Mordecai Rickler. That's an interesting story by, Ger- uh, Gerald Geyser. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, and Peter Bart produced this. You know that? I did not Peter know Bart. that. Peter Bart of Variety. My goodness. Crazy. Um, like Father, Like Son, one of the body switching movies, Dudley Moore and Kirk Cameron. Man, there was a run of those there <laughs> for a oh, while. Good heavens! I, I get. Did, did it, I, no, I was gonna. I was gonna say it started with big, but no, it goes. You can go further back yeah. than that. Yeah. Uh, but there was a run of Boy. those in the eighties, man. I love Dudley Moore, and uh, you know I could care less about Kirk Cameron, but uh, boy, this uh, this is weird. Uh, and by the way, the screenplay was by Lorne Cameron. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say probably not related. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, the New Adventures of Pippi Longstocking, uh, the uh, Ken Anakin movie from uh, ni- from when was this? Let's see. Uh, it's got to be what sixty nine, seventy something. Is like that? that? Oh, oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, whenever it is. Anyway, uh, the New Adventures of Pippi Longstocking. What? Uh, uh, what? Are, what are we? Uh, what are we to make of of this phenomenon from Sweden that just will not go away? You know, well, that's what it was, right? Back oh, then, this is nineteen eighty something. Nineteen eighty something. Anyway, it, yeah. really? It seems like, well, the new adventures. The new adventures. This is the new adventures. Yeah. So, but 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 still, as a part of that phenomenon, that was just the most bizarre thing. Um, I, I mean, as a kid, I remember you know watching these these plain, these movies are and they were dubbed, of course, when we and they were just completely and wholly out of sync. Uh, with the whole of this sort of bizarre uh, shenanigans going on in them, but you know uh, they there they are. Yeah, uh, we got girl. In a, we got two kind of feminist themed films: uh, Girl Interrupted, uh, which won Angelina Jolie her Academy Award, and then Fifty Five Steps with Hilary Swank and Helena Bonham Carter. Uh, Tim. I don't remember 55 Steps. I don't either. I do remember Girl Interrupted. That was a big deal. Girl Interrupted was a big deal. I mean, uh, you know, Winona Ryder was was the thing, but then Angelina Jolie kind of came out of nowhere and and won an Oscar for that. And, uh, you know, I'd forgotten James Mangold directed this. Yeah, yeah. This was the film that kind of put him on the map, and now he's doing the – he's injuring uh, Harrison Ford on the new Indiana Jones film. (laughs) Back in the – That's what he's doing. Back in what, 99, 2000, something like that, man. Yeah, something yeah. like that. And then, uh, so 55 steps, uh, you know, I, this is, uh, Jeffrey Tambor is in this and he, he's really quite good in it, but I, I, I don't remember this movie in any way, shape or form at all whatsoever, but it is, um, uh, it's a, it's an interesting, one of those psychiatric ward movies, you know, female friendship buddy movie. One of them, you know, I kind of rain Manny a little bit with Helena Bonham Carter overacting a bit. And Jeffrey Tambor, because Jeffrey Tambor is in Girl Interrupted. Yes. And I tell you who else is in Girl Interrupted. And, you know, this guy, you, 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 I knew last time I saw this movie was in 1999, but I had, I I did not, so I didn't, I hadn't forgotten, but I did not know at the time that Elizabeth Moss is in Girl Interrupted. Yeah. I did know that Brittany Murphy, the late Brittany Murphy was, I remember she was in Girl Interrupted. Uh, back then, but yeah, Jeffrey Dick Tambor was in that movie too, along with Angelina and Wynota. So you know, well, it's you know, I mean, mostly these movies about somebody in the system who's you know usually someone who's wrongly imprisoned, and an attorney has to come in, and they become friends with their attorney, and the whole thing. I mean, we've seen a lot of those. Murder in the First was was that thing mm-hmm. with Kevin Bacon and uh, and uh, and Christian Slater. Um, more recently, the uh, the Jamie Fox thing. Um, uh, with Michael B. Jordan and Jamie Fox. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, just right. mercy, yeah, just mercy. You know, so we 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 get a lot of these, and this is one of those with Helena Bonham Carter as a psychiatric patient and uh, Hilary Swank as her attorney. Basically, it's one of those movies, but it's fine. It's well acted. I just don't remember this movie no. at all. No. I don't. Uh, but you know, Billy August directed it. Um, no. so there. Yeah, I mean, there it is. I it's I, I you know. It, I guess this is it, it, it. This came out relatively recently, but I have no recollection of it. Sometimes didn't it come. Just, didn't, yeah. it, sometimes you know, if not on one of our film week weeks. It's like whatever. Mm. Um, all right, here's the last batch of these. These Universal titles now. Uh, the American Pie movies. We've oh got goodness. American Pie, American Pie Two, American Reunion, American Wedding. All of them in their unrated versions. 
These were a big deal at the time. Uh, full disclosure, uh, at least one of them was, was, uh, DP'd by my good friend Lloyd Ahern. And, uh, the cinematography is awesome. I think it was American <laughs> Wedding was the one that he was, the one he shot, which was directed by Jesse Dillon, uh, who hasn't gone on to make a lot of movies. But question is, does this franchise still hold, uh, our attention or is the whole, my thing really kind of done. Well, look, we're going all the way back to 1999 now. Uh, those Wheats brothers, Paul and Chris. So, you know, Jason and Chris Klein, uh, look, I'm not sure that you can get away with a whole lot of these jokes anymore. I, I mean, the, 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 so. the, the central joke, you know, with, with the, you know, the hole in the pie, um, you know, I'm not, you know, and, and certainly even if you can't get away with it, I'm not sure how funny it is. <laughs> it, I, yeah. you know. Um, know. Uh, 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 charming cast of characters, you know, uh, uh, actors, a lot of them, uh, you know, have gone on to do some interesting stuff. Um, and this all seems like fodder for a sitcom to me a, yeah. you know, maybe a sassy netflix series rather than a series of major motion pictures yeah uh th- th- they were you know spanning that assuming some odd 20 odd years however long it's been there yeah all right a couple of couple of british films here that uh, that i am hugely fond of uh i still love these movies but tim you tell me do these still live in the culture notting hill and billy elliott you know i i i just i have no objections at all uh, in my memory, uh, to either one of those films, I love them both. Um, uh, uh, of, of those films, particularly Billy Elliot, and uh, it, it, Billy Elliot also because Billy Elliot is representative of a very particular period. Billy Elliot is not set uh, contemporary yeah. to its to its time. Set during yeah that this period during the coal strikes strikes and whatnot right. Right. In, in, in the UK. So so um, it, it, that's that's interesting in, in and of itself. But Notting Hill, which was you know contemporary to its moment, that why, when, whenever I think about Notting Hill, I just still get a you know a bit of a knot in my stomach and uh, and uh, it's a that beautiful beautiful uh, sequence. Uh, where they where, where we go through the change of the seasons and oh my uh, gosh when he's walking through oh, yeah. that, that visual effects thing that was beautiful uh, so so That's yeah I, I think I think both of those movies are, are, are movies you can queue up and, and and enjoy just as much today as you could back then I kind of uh, kind of I, I agree Stephen Daldry uh, came of age as a director with Billy Elliot and now he's doing you know every episode of The Crown yeah there you go mm. um. So we got we got some sort of 19th century Americana stories here as well. We've got the uh, Sofia Coppola remake of The Beguiled, mm-hmm. which uh, aims to put sort of a, a, a more female centric spin on the story that was originally directed by uh, Clint Eastwood. We got the old John Wayne, Kirk Douglas, Western, The War Wagon. Um, and then we've got Tap Roots with Van Heflin and Susan Hayward and, you know, amazing cast of supporting actors like Ward Bond and Boris Karloff and Julie London, which is uh, this George Marshall directed kind of melodrama that, that all takes place in the uh, in the 19th century. It's a, you know, a, uh, it feels a little bit dated. Anything there, Tim, that you think uh, is worth paying attention to? Well, we'll say this about The Beguiled. Uh, so, you know, the 1971 Clint Eastwood film mm-hmm. and Sophia's film with Nicole Kidman and Kirsten Dunst in yeah. 2017. And Colin Farrell playing uh, and, the original East, East uh, part. Yeah. Partic- particularly the Colin Farrell thing, because he's playing that with his natural accent. And I, yeah, yeah, look, yeah, 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 I, back in 19-whatever, I read that book uh, when I was in junior high. That was, that's an adaptation of a novel. And the... Coppola film is truer to the book than the Eastwood film, particularly that thing to do with Colin, because that's, that happened a lot. He, the character in her film was paid by a rich man to go fight in that war for him, that civil war. Yeah. Uh, he had no stake in the, in, in the fight whatsoever from, from the North or the South. Uh, he was simply poor and you could do that. This was a thing that actually happened quite often. Uh, and, and, and that was brought over from the book. And I thought that that was really, really interesting that, that, uh, Sophia knew to bring that over from the book. She made it a, a bit more of a feminist sort of thing, uh, rather than just a bunch of, you know, teenage girls in heat, yeah. which is more or less was what was going yeah. on in Clint's yeah. movie. Um, uh, which, which is kind of okay with, uh, with me too. But getting the little bits of, little pieces of history, right? I, I appreciate yeah. that, but I still like that Clint Eastwood film. Yeah, I like them both. Yeah. Um, you know, I will say this about the War Wagon, which I think bear, warrants a little bit of a t- It's basically a gold heist movie. You know, it's uh, it's John Wayne and Kirk Douglas trying to steal gold from a land baron and his very heavily armored 
uh, train. But whenever I see it's, I mean, it's okay. But whenever I see the, this, this marquee with John Wayne and Kirk Douglas, I'm always reminded of the time, the story that Kirk Douglas would always tell about when John Wayne bawled him out for playing Van Gogh in Vincent <laughs> Minnelli's Lust for Life. Yeah. I mean, it, because John, and it was serious. Like John Wayne pulled him inside and said, what are you doing playing a painter? Guys like us do not play painters. Like there was a whole, there was a whole thing. Like in Wayne's mind, being a painter, if it didn't mean that you were gay, it meant you were almost gay. <laughs> yeah, he was not a man. Like, you're, you're not playing almost, a manly man. Yeah, you're not for a, sure. Like men do not paint. <laughs> yeah, like, real men do not paint. And they know, certainly, that. and they certainly don't go crazy and cut off your. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not, men don't do any of these things. Uh, yeah, what I thought was interesting is the way uh, Douglas took all of that. He, he, you know, he was just like, yeah, wow, <laughs> you, you just, uh, and yes, you know, look at those careers, you know, the yeah, and, and they're in lots of difference, you know, yeah. Uh, John went out being uh, who? Who did he go out? He, he went out being uh, Rooster Cogburn. Rooster Cogburn, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. Well, the last three here, uh, we've got Walter Matthau and Julie Andrews and Little Miss Marker, which uh, I think is a, is a really sweet little gem that uh, oftentimes gets uh, unfairly forgotten. Uh, it, it's it's this is you know this is a this is a cool little film and it's got great supporting cast: Tony Curtis, Bob Newhart, Lee Grant, all joining on this. You can't can't not love that. Um, the seventh son, or it's perhaps just seventh son, not no the on it, uh, with, uh, Julianne Moore and Jeff Bridges kind of, uh, was one of these big CGI things that, that flopped rather badly a couple of years ago. Mm. Uh, it's probably been about five or six years now. And, uh, you know, that's strictly for people that love that stuff, but also want to put a, put a shout out for, um, the last days, the Oscar winning Steven Spielberg produced show a foundation, um, mm-hmm. a Holocaust doc directed by James Mall, which has been remastered from the original 35 millimeter film and re-release on Blu-ray MOD, uh, one best documentary. Then it would probably win it again. Now it is a, it is a deeply, deeply moving movie. And, um, you know, these, these, the eyewitness testimony is running away from us very fast. Now we are, uh, we're, you know, within the next couple of decades, we'll be hitting, uh, these people will be in their nineties mm. and, uh, you know, by the, by the 19 mid uh, 20 thirties, they're going to be gone. Yeah. So, you know, these are, these are important testimonies to have. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tim, let's, um, want to, want to, want to cover the criterions here. Let's hit these criterions let's uh let's start with pariah uh, yeah I, 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 I was gonna say wow you know what a what an auspicious launch of a career yeah. uh, uh that movie was for 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 d uh, for d Rees, uh pariah 2011 film uh about a young black gay t- uh, teenager uh, coming of age uh story uh, beautifully done uh, in and, ten and, years, dude. Ten well, years. Yeah, it goes by so fast. Kim Wayans in that I movie. I think that's the last time I've seen Kim Wayans uh, in a movie playing her mother. It's just, it's just, it's just a, a lovely film about a Brooklyn teenager coming of age as a as a young uh, uh, gay woman. D, of course, uh, uh, has gone on to do a whole bunch of other things, but one of them, of course, being uh, Mud. Yeah, Mudbound. Mudbound. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, um, which is just a powerful film, you know, this, this, this that post war during the war in the South and, uh, David O'Yell, just really, really, really good movie. Um, um, uh, so, so yeah, uh, an auspicious beginning of D. Ree's career. I, I remember the, the LAFCA voting that year. This, uh, that's where I knew that this movie really had kind of carved itself a place. You know, we get a lot of indies every year and we talk about them like the nest, you know, this year where you think it's going to have some awards potential and it just doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. But, um, I remember, you know, Pariah was one of those movies that year where everybody was kind of talking about it, but nobody thought that anybody else would be talking about it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Everyone sort of thought it was their little personal discovery, but it's, it's, you know, nobody else is going to watch this. And suddenly we're in the voting and it's like pariah, 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 you know, and, and it's, it's rippling through the room and it didn't wind up winning any awards from this, but it was in the mix yeah. it was very strongly in the mix, wound up uh, really kind of carving its place. And people, I think, saw this amazing talent and D Rees uh, has, has definitely carved herself a place. She's done uh, very, very well for herself and she gets the criterion treatment now. Yeah. She yeah. Is immortalized with criterion. Um, the, here's one that's a little bit from left field is tiny, the life of Aaron Blackwell, um, and streetwise, um, together on one, uh, unified, 
uh, disc. These are both movies that were co-directed uh, by Mary Ellen Mark and Martin Bell. And um, I, I'm not overly familiar with either of them, to be honest. Uh, they're separated by decades. Streetwise was made in 1984. Yeah, that was the early 80s. Yeah. Yeah, 84. And uh, then they made Tiny, The Life of Aaron Blackwell in 2016. I don't know and Tiny, but Streetwise, I remember. That was a really, really uh, – it's it, it set, set in like Seattle or something. Like, it's just, just, just following these street kids. Yeah. Uh, uh, just, it's, just just following it, these street kids all around Seattle. It's, it's really heavy. And, and, and Martin Bell is, uh, you know, basic, I mean, basically a documentarian. But Mary Ellen Mark is a, is a photographer. And so you're getting a really interesting mix of sensibilities here. Uh, Cheryl McCall actually co-directed Streetwise with him. This, she's mm. the one more, but she was not involved in Tiny. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, Streetwise is a, is a really, really fascinating movie. And uh, Aaron Blackwell, I thought, was uh, very, very interesting um, because it was actually begun roughly around the same time. And then it took them like 30 years to, to complete the film. And uh, Blackwell's a really interesting figure. Um uh, yeah, you, Aaron Blackwell is in is one of the is in characters figures yeah, yeah people it's, being it's followed like in a, Streetwise yeah it's sort of a semi it's sort of a semi sequel of of sorts but a very very rough life you know addiction and uh, you know she's a single mom and and all of the stuff that that sort of goes into into that so as a as kind of an overarching uh, portrait these two films are really kind of a, an amazing tapestry divided by all these decades. And, um, it's, you know, it's an, un one of those unusual criterion releases that you sort of don't expect. Um, visions of eight is, is rather perfectly oh, timed yeah. with the Olympics coming out. Yeah. This is from the, uh, Munich 1972 Olympics, and it is eight different films, um, by different world-class directors, including Milos, you got mentioned Milos. John Schlesinger. Yeah. Uh, you, you, I mean, you, you've got, uh, Milos Forman did the decathlon, Claude yeah. Lelouch, the loser, oh, yeah, Schlesinger yeah. did the longest, oh, yeah. uh, Connie Chikawa, the fastest, um, Michael Flager, uh, the women, Arthur mm. Penn did the highest, Mai Zetterling did the yeah. strongest and yeah. uh, Yuri Ozrov, the beginning, eight yeah. really cool, uh, Olympic movies. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, not stuff. to not to mention, you know, some of the people we're looking at uh, in that in those Olympics would include folks like, uh, well, Bruce Jenner then, Caitlyn yeah. Caitlyn Jenner now, Olga Corbett. I mean, these are the, the I mean, it's funny all these names. Olga for sure, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Avery Brundage, uh, who's like the director of the, uh, I guess the the entire. Well, the, the United States Olympic Committee for, yeah. for, for the entire the entirety of the, the the modern Olympic era up into the 70s, so like 50 years. He was the guy that ran all of that stuff. So, yeah, it's really fascinating. And then the last one, um, which almost makes me break into tears, even mentioning it, the uh, Masaki Kobayashi's The Human Condition Trilogy, which is released here finally on Blu-ray as just The Human Condition. Mm. Um, uh, so they're, they're presenting it as if it was a single film and, uh, it really is a single film. I mean, it is, I, I like to consider it the greatest trilogy ever made. And I know that's, that's high praise because you're going up against things like, you know, blue, white, and red, the Kieslowski trilogy, um, you know, obviously Lord of the Rings. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of heavy hitting stuff in there, but the human condition for those who don't know Kobayashi is somewhat uh, semi-autobiographical in this. His World War II experience kind of informs this. And each of these films is about three hours long. And you're, you know, the whole, the whole saga is, is nearly 10 hours long. And it is well worth setting aside a day and just watching this thing through if you can handle it emotionally. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely devastating. Made in the late, late 50s into the early 60s. Um, and it is uh, effectively the, the, the saga of a, uh, a of one Japanese uh, soldier and his his journey through all of these these episodes during World War II, mm. and uh, most movies that Americans see about World War II tend to be the American point of view, uh, which is to be expected, or the British point of view. It's it's always the Allied point of view, and it, you know if if the the Axis point of view is depicted, it is depicted you know without a great deal of humanity. These are the bad guys. It's a good thing that we beat them, and you know. Yeah. Uh, all quite on all quite on the Western Front being the the, the, the exception, but or the, the maybe 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 does both. 
Maybe Dust Boat for sure. Um, but, but yeah, that's a great example. But the human condition is just devastating because this is based very much in, in what many Japanese soldiers actually experienced. And, uh, I, I, I can't emphasize this too strongly that, you know, we have this impression that the Japanese were all of these, these crazed, cultish, you know, suicidal kamikaze warriors who dug themselves into, you know, caves and wouldn't come out for years and, you know, unless you flamethrower them out and they were going to die for the emperor and they had to be deprogrammed. Oh, it was, it, it became a part of the, of, 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 of the storyline, the narrative storyline, even in, even in, uh, well post war television of the seventies yeah. and sixties and seventies, literally stories about these Japanese soldiers, uh, on an island five years after the war, yeah. you know, still holding out. It became narratives of storylines. Yeah, Ent- entirely. And and we we miss just how many stories there are of these guys who didn't want to be there. They didn't want to fight. Um, they they knew that the cause was wrong. They knew the cause was lost. They they had questions. Some were afraid. You know, they're human beings like everybody else. And we sometimes lose sight of that humanity. And uh, that is what drives all nearly 10 hours of the Human Condition trilogy. Mm. It is. It is masterful filmmaking, and uh, you know my all due respect to people who love Kurosawa. When people ask me who's your favorite Japanese filmmaker, I always say it's Kobayashi. It's far and away it's Kobayashi because of this and Quite On. Mm. Um, I, I you know if 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 I were a filmmaker and I could say you know I don't need to make twenty movies, I don't need to be ten movies. If I could just say I made the Human Condition and Quite On, I could I could die and go to heaven yeah, and, yeah. and and be proud of my life. So there's that. Um. Tim, let me let me let me kick through a few docs here real quickly because uh, we do have a few interesting docs. Uh, I, I I know you're a big fan of Journeys Through French Cinema, the oh, uh, oh, tavern, yes. the Tavern Yay saga. That's yeah. all. That's a, an eight part monster. Because um, we lost him not too terribly long ago. Uh, not so long uh, ago. That's yeah, on yeah. Blu-ray now from Cohen. Well, what's what's interesting about that series is uh, it's him talking mostly, and he himself, you know, he the, as, as a filmmaker, as a person, uh, as as a journalist and a scholar, he is a connection uh, between uh, the sort of uh, post-war new wave uh, and everything that would come after that in French cinema, including including his films. Um, um, uh, and 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 watch, listen to him talk about these. things things being a sort of uh, uh, direct connection is what's fascinating about that movie because he has these sort of insights uh, that lend, that lend uh, um, yeah, to, to, to both eras uh, in French cinema. Uh, so that's what I think that I love the most about, about that. It's about him and his films, but, but he is a scholar of all of these things and he's the connective tissue. He's literally the connective tissue between these things. Who did he work for? He worked for... Um, he was uh, uh, he, he was he was an assistant director for um 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 uh, oh, it's, 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 but you know yeah it's out of my head but I'll think so I mean a number a number of great directors he was an assistant director for but it was uh, uh, Le Samurai Mel- thank you thank you Melville Melville thank you he was Melville's assistant you know uh, director. Yeah. so so you know and 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 those are the kind of ins- when you work for folks like that those are the kind of insights that you bring plus he uh, he was a, a, a child of cinema at that particular period of time when Godard and you know, and you know, and you know all of these filmmakers were doing the things that they do uh, and, and while at the same time. Time, and, and because all of them were were children of American cinema, you know yeah. Ford, and, and also so he was uh, sort of uh, uh, taking all of these things in uh, from a perspective that just most people didn't get. Together. And, and, and then he brought all of, this, all of that stuff to bear in his cinema. So because when, when you look at his cinema, Merchant Cinema, uh, what do we see? We see everything. We yeah, see all possible modes of filmmaking uh, uh, that he, that he has at his disposal. They just had a tribute to all of his films on Criterion Channel not long ago, and I watched uh, Captain Conan again, which is just so amazing. It's just one of the best World War One movies I've ever seen. Um, we got a bunch of kind of bi- biographical docs here, which I'll go through real quickly. We have the very highly acclaimed Oliver Sacks, His Own Life by Rick Burns. Not Ken Burns, but Rick this mm-hmm. time, who's also a very, very fine documentarian. Um, which is, uh, which is lovely. Uh, you know, Oliver Sacks sat down in 2015 for a whole bunch of interviews, 
uh, to kind of revisit his life. And uh, it, this this just is so comprehensive. And, um, you know, we're well, now new, 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 new neurologist, neuro, neuro, neuroscientist, neurologist. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you get a, a wonderful sense of him. Uh, Dolly in Search of Immortality is a is a great documentary about the uh, the life of Salvador Dolly and his work and his art and his just the madness that made this guy genius. I mean. You know, a normal person, no, and thank God for that. Yeah, because yeah. you know we we are the beneficiaries of that. I love the way that I love the, I love the way that film connects Dolly uh, all the way back to Disney. They did a lot of work together. Uh, they did. Uh, Walt true. Disney and, and Favreau Dolly, beautiful, beautiful stuff there. So a lot of times we forget that you know he's this great fine artist, but you know he liked cartoons. Uh, that's right. He sure did. Uh, we have Moby Doc. I don't know if Moby's old enough to justify a fully biographical doc, but boy, he's a weird dude. And uh, people kind of pile on him a little bit too much, you know, all that all that Natalie Portman was my girlfriend stuff. And Natalie Portman <laughs> tweets out and says, yeah, excuse me. Well, OK, maybe not. And in, in, in the same way that uh, Brooke Shields was uh, yeah, Michael right. Jackson's girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Standing next to them doesn't make them your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> you have to but, actually uh, but, you know, uh, have a relationship. That's a great analogy. But but Moby, Moby, you know, is a guy who had a really difficult childhood and is is a really fascinating artist so uh you know it may be premature but that's an interesting doc mm. we talked about billy holiday earlier uh and billy is an absolutely beautiful beautiful tribute to an amazing icon in american uh, music history yeah. i think sometimes billy gets a little bit lost uh in the shadow of other singers of her some of her contemporaries mm. and uh you know you know ella fitzgerald tends to cast a very very long shadow but, you know, if you listen to Billy's voice and her music, and I'm glad, you know, we had the recent movie as well, um, really uh, ripe for rediscovery and, and, to, and to sort of own her place. Uh, this is a beautiful movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that movie and this movie are uh, something of a corrective to the sort yep. of notion that we have as Billy as being a tragic uh, drug addled figure. Yes. True. More complicated. Overwhelmed by that. Yeah, yes, much, much, more much, much more complicated than that. Uh, and then we, as long as we're on the music topic, The Change in Times of Ike White by filmmaker Dan Vernon. Uh, Ike White, kind of a pivotal figure in soul, but not one that is widely known, sort of more influential than famous. And uh, Change in Times was his big album, which was released in 1976. And again, you know, a uh, very, very troubled life, but a prodigy, uh, an amazing talent and uh Great music and deeply influential, but one of these, you know, just a lot of demons, mm. a lot of demons. Um, and then we also have Beautiful Darling, The Life and Times of Candy Darling, uh, Andy Warhol's superstar. Candy Darling, uh, like with Billy, I think is overshadowed by her demons as well and her association with uh, Andy Warhol. So it's, mm. uh, it's nice to sort of get a little bit of a corrective here as well. Um, interviews here with a lot of people who knew her, including Julie Newmar and mm. Fran Lebowitz and John Waters. You know, you, you realize what a swath of culture she cut, cut across. And um, wonderful narration, her own words narrated by uh, Chloe Sevigny. So that's also a really, uh, a very, very touching and, and important film. Yeah. Um, uh, Tim, let's talk about uh, Nation Time for a second here, because we are both uh, big fans of William Greaves. And who tends to be known primarily for uh, Symbiopsychotaxiplasm, which, of course, got the Criterion Collection. But this is the 80-minute uh, fully restored cut of Nation Time, his, um, his, his Gary, Indiana documentary about the uh, 1972 National Black Political Oh, Convention. man, the, the poetry, uh, Mir Baraka. Uh, you're reading, you're reading Langston Hughes and Charles Diggs. It's just, you know, yeah, this, uh, the music. It's funny. Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson and, uh, and yeah. Walter Fontroy, all of these, Chris Scott, all of Bobby Seale, all of these sort of, you Harry Belafonte, all of these sort of figures from the period who show up, uh, in this film, documented in this film, uh, very often reciting poems or other folks' poems, uh, uh, in places where you will never ever see them again. Uh, the Jackson family, all, all just, just, it's just an amazing sort of thing. So anyway, this is like what, 1971, 72, 72, because it was the 72, 72. uh, thing. So it's just a fascinating, fascinating thing. So glad, uh, that it was, that it's, uh, been documented. And there were these voices here sort of across the political spectrum, really. You know, this yeah. is like just not some just sort of like left 
the wing it's a, it's sort of rally. No, uh, no, it's, no. A, it's again far and away more complicated than that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tapestry. Yeah, it's a tapestry. And and I love. I still. You know, I'm going to share it again. I know I've shared it before, but I love sharing my William Greaves story, which is that when Lafka got behind, thanks to Ray Green's uh, initiative, got behind the films that got away series, where you know movies that had never gotten a proper theatrical release, and on our first series of that, we included Symbiopsychotaxi Plasm. Mm-hmm. And uh, then shortly thereafter, I was in New York piggybacking on my wife's per diem while she was working on the, uh, the <laughs> Steve Buscemi film. Uh, uh. And and um, there was a there was a William Greaves uh, series at uh, at Tribeca, and I went down and and saw it, and he was there. And uh, I just went up to him and I said, you know, Mr. Greaves, I, I didn't, I wasn't there when you were in Los Angeles for the films that got away, but just wanted to let you know, I'm, I'm one of the people on that, uh, that was on that committee that, uh, you know, programmed uh, Symbiopsychotaxiplasm. And before I could even finish my sentence, the man hugged me. Yeah. He threw his arms around me. Total stranger. <sighs> it, just, it's, it was so touching. And I'm, I'm just, I'm so moved to this day that, that, you know, he, he, he truly an incredible, kind, brilliant, gentle man. And uh, I think perhaps that may be why he didn't have a more forceful career or a longer career, because he was he's one of the soft artists. Yeah. You know, sometimes you got to have that lion anger that comes out to, to beat your way through. And he just wasn't that guy. But yeah, yeah. Nation Nation Time is a, is a really beautiful chronicle and document and tapestry of a very, very important historical moment. Yeah. Um, Tim, Assassins. I know you're a fan of Assassins, this freaking lunatic insane story of the women that killed Kim Jong-un's brother. Uh, it, I, because I got to tell you, you know, it's really amazing sometimes. Uh, you know, a, a news story comes into the, and, 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 you know, into the, and you, you watch the news story and, and you pay attention to it and you think you know and you think you understand it and all this kind of stuff. And these, these filmmakers go out and they go, go looking around that whole situation. And we find out a whole different reality about what yeah. we thought. A, who these two young women were in the first place, and they and they were literally just that: these two yeah. young women trying to make it as actress model types, and that's all it is. And this almost—I mean, if I didn't, if I didn't, if we didn't know it were all true, and resulted in the death of of, yeah. of, of Kim's what was it, his cousin, uncle, brother, whatever it was, it was, it was, it was his brother, it was one of his, his one of his half, brother. one of his brothers, right? Yeah, like uh, a half brother. Yeah, yeah. well, they asked you all. Uh, if we didn't know this were all true, if you were to tell me this story as a story, I'd say you know that 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 sounds like an interesting episode of uh, you know nineteen sixties Mission Impossible or something. <laughs> Uh, episode, but it's not. It's it actually happened, and it's just fascinating the way it unravels uh, this story. So assassins, and that's that's what it's about. It's about the truth, what is likely the reality behind that assassination of Kim's uh, half brother uh, and the and the young women uh, who it was pinned on. Uh, and how these filmmakers uh, uh, you know, reveal the reality of what happened there. So a few others I'll get through so we can get to some uh, new stuff. We have some really good new stuff to get to today. Uh, we've got uh, It's Not a Burden, which is a recent and wonderful Gravitas Ventures uh, documentary uh, about h- how to handle the, the you know, aging, aging parents, aging people in your, in your life, aging loved ones. Yeah. And uh, it is um, – Having done this, you know, I uh, full disclosure, I, I cared for my mother and my aunt mm-hmm. in their in their final days and, it, you know, dementia in both cases. And it is just not it's not easy. Uh, and this is this really is a is very therapeutic for anybody has who has done it or who may need to do it. It's a, it, this will lift your soul and it'll it'll help you sort of find a way through. Uh, it's very nicely done. It's very touching, very humanistic. And uh, I, I deeply appreciated it. Um also, want to give a, a, a wonderful shout out. A complete uh, conflict of interest here, but um, Otto Lenghi and the Cakes of Versailles is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful documentary. Now, um, uh, I, I have to absolutely point out as well that uh, uh, Laura Gabbert, who directed this, is an acquaintance of mine. Um, she's also a UCLA grad. She was a, a graduate student at UCLA when I was an undergrad. I talked to her every once in a while. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, friends and acquaintances in common. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I have to point that out. I do know the filmmaker. But that being said, she's a very, very good filmmaker and really, really superb. And this is just an exquisite uh, look at, the, at, at Chef Yotam Odolengi, 
who is trying to uh, basically bring bring his Versailles sensibilities uh, to life as a in basically the form of a cake for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And uh, as kind of unreal and strange as that may sound, it's this amazing artistic crossover endeavor that is captured so beautifully here because you you are exposed to what it means to be a pastry chef. And don't assume for a second that pastry chefs are not true artists. Mm. They may be the greatest artists in the world because they're creating art that will be eaten. It's going to go away. It's like people who do sandcastles. It's yeah. going to go away. And yeah. I can't imagine a more painful thing and yet a more gratifying thing than to do something that you know will be gone yeah. it's going to disappear. All your work will be eaten. And and the people eating it aren't aren't eating it with the same gusto that you used to make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes like it takes a few minutes to eat something, but anyway. Anna Lenke and the Cakes of Versailles, pretty great. Uh, and then Mayer. Tim, did you see Mayer, the David Osset film about the um, about Musa Hadid, the uh, Christian mayor of Ramallah in the in the uh, West Bank? I don't think I saw that one. I don't think I saw that one. It, I, I had to cover this one for Film Week as well. It's really fascinating. I mean, it's it, and it. When, when what's nice is that it, it, this is not a this is not a, a, a take sides kind of Israeli Palestinian doc, which you know too much of our current politics gets sort of torn apart in in documentaries um th this isn't saying these people are right these people are wrong it's 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 him it's a profile of this guy who is a palestinian mayor of a major city ramallah and he is christian and uh this deals with some incredibly complex issues uh and it doesn't sort of try to give you an answer it just it, it lets you wrestle with it and boy it really is um, it's a very, very important film and I, and I really highly recommend it. Hmm. Uh, and then the last two, well, let, let's, let's do these last three here. Um, narratives of modern genocide, uh, is, you know, pretty, pretty brutal, but these are all, this is a combination. This is a, you know, from PBS and NPR. Um, this is a, a just a, a collage of accounts of people who survived, um, genocides and in various shapes. Genocide doesn't have to kill millions. It can even it can still kill thousands. It's mm. the intent and the uh, the perpetrators that define it as genocide. So you know you have uh, accounts from people who survived uh, the killing fields and uh, the school children massacre in Burundi. Um, absolutely essential to see that we keep trying to make it not happen again. Uh, Love Express is about the disappearance of Valerian Borowit Bor Bor Oh, I can never pronounce his name. <laughs> Rochik, yeah. Borovchik, the, the famous uh, uh, exploitation director. Um, uh, Borovchik, I guess, is the, the correct pronunciation. But um, this is from uh, Altered Innocence, uh, the, uh, the exploitation label. And people may not have known that in, in the 1970s, Valerian, who after making all of these very famous exploitation films, basically kind of uh, disappeared from, from public. And they have some really interesting interviews in here with people, including uh, Neil Jordan and Terry Gilliam, who, who give you some great insight into mm. this manic figure. And then lastly, uh, Jazz on a Summer's Day, uh, yeah. one of the great documentaries about jazz. Yeah. I just I, to me, this is like definitive, you know, um, every, everybody who was anybody in jazz from its inception until 1959 when this movie was was made uh, is depicted here. And, uh, you know, I, I just think it's wonderful. I love this movie. Fantastic. All right, Tim, where do we go? Uh, Want to look at some of these 4Ks? Some of the, some, some of the 4K business? Yeah, let's, let's do the 4Ks. Uh, at the top of which I see Willy Wonka, <laughs> the original Willy Wonka, Gene Wilder's yeah. Willy Wonka. Uh, yeah. um, so what, what are we looking like? If every anything should be should have been put out on 4K, needs to have been put out on 4K at some time. Uh, this is a movie that's meant to pop, crackle, and just jump right the hell off the screen. What does it look like? Uh, it looks amazing. They just cranked up the color. I mean, the purple hair, the green hair, the, 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 the red mushrooms, all the, everything that just sparkles in this thing. I don't know that this ever looked this good on 35 millimeter. Mm. I, I think this is a, this is really a super, it, and they don't overdo it. It's really wonderful. The Wonka kids, uh, all grown up do the uh, commentary, which is a lot of fun. And, um, you know, it's got extras on it, much of which we people have already seen. Uh, story of Willy Wonka and the uh, 
uh, pure imagination. The story of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the documentary, is 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 really excellent. It's pretty much the only thing you need. But yeah, the movie looks great. The 4K is fantastic. There was a nice Blu-ray box set that had a lot of goodies in it re- previously released. But um, I I think you know you can double dip and and keep them both. Keep the extras on that one, but watch the movie on this one. And because this is uh, Warner, you get a movies anywhere code, so you can add it to all of your digital lockers. This is this, this, this wrong, doll. Uh, this is every door commentary or interview or anything like that. You know, no, nothing, nothing. No, about you wrote no, this, you know, nothing. I always thought it was interesting. He actually wrote the, you know, wrote the, you wrote the book or wrote the screenplay too. Yeah. Uh, for that, uh, uh, in the line of fire, the uh, the nineteen ninety three in the line of fire, Wolfgang, Wolfgang, and uh, Clint Eastwood and John Malkovich and Rene Russo. Uh, I remember enjoying this movie so much. It was, it was, it was, it was one of those because President Clinton was a big movie fan. Yeah, uh, back then, that's right. and I remember him him talking about how much he loved this 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 movie, and it was one of the things that made it quite popular at the time. Uh, how does it hold up? Uh, you know, it holds up, and this is how sick I am. Uh, this is what a deranged human being I am because when I watch this movie again, I had the same thought that I had the first time, which was. You know, that ceramic gun of John Malkovich's, that would work. Mm. I could totally make one of those and sneak that on a plane. I could <laughs> totally do that. This is how lame I am. And I'm going to be on a plane in a few weeks. And I'm putting this out there in, in, in the world. You know, I can, I can just see like, I, it, watch, watch me at the airport getting pulled aside by, by you know, the, uh, the, 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 the agents. Okay, come over here. Sorry. Mm. We uh, mm. listen to your podcast. We're going to have to, we're going to have to take you aside and uh, question you. <laughs> oh, crap. I'm absolutely positive right. they had all kinds of stuff to do. <laughs> Sniff that business out with now, but it was a hell of an idea uh, back it's, in the time. Yeah, it, it really it's it, look, it's a great it's a terrific movie. It's a great pairing of talent. Uh, Wolfgang Peterson was exactly the right guy to do it. And again, movies anywhere. You get your digital locker code. Uh, Indiana Jones for movie collection. Mm. We're enjoying the, uh, the 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 40 year anniversary now of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, Karen Allen has been having to go on all kinds of radio shows and be humiliated by trying to explain how no Indiana Jones was not a pedophile and he did not <laughs> groom Marion. Shut up. Um, just because of that one line, I was a child. Well, people with no sense of proportion go, no. a child? How, well, what kind of child? How old were you? Shut up. Yeah, yeah just relax, everybody. Relax. Uh, Anyway, these movies hold up. I watched uh, Temple of Doom again the other day, yep. 4K. Yep. Um, I watched it on Movies Anywhere. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if I ever told you, but when I was an usher at the National Theater, which has now been demolished, mm. uh, I worked when that, that movie opened. That opened at the National. And I remember we had six preview screenings, six private screenings for press and for the studio and all these people. And I made sure that I didn't have to work any of those nights so that I could show up and sneak in and watch all. I had seen the film a half dozen times by opening day (laughs) to this day. I can still sing anything goes in Mandarin. Thank you. Kate Capshaw. (laughs) Okay. I can do it. Oh yes. But I, I, I I love, I, you know, I, that movie, I particularly have a soft spot for despite all of the criticism of it. That's the movie that gave us the PG 13. We can blame it for that, but I still have a, I still have a soft spot for, for uh, temple of doom. Oh, the thing with the heart. Do you have the heart with the with yeah? The, uh, it's all you know. It's all it's all taken from old movies anyway. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, if the kids in the '30s uh, saw that at the theater, nobody is that that is that that uh yeah. Odenkirk, Odenkirk movie, which I actually rather enjoyed. Um, uh, it's like a John Wicky. It's John Wick for with a nerd. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And, and, and frankly, a little bit more quote unquote realistic than the John Wick films. You know, it's it's, it's more about fighting than guns. Uh, but it's but it walks the same pathway. What I like about it is that bob is playing against type totally uh completely and totally and yet um the way he has designed the character you believe it you totally. believe that he is that guy beneath all of that stuff he even looks great he's lean oh, he and fantastic. and uh and uh you know and and and, 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 and uh, the, the choreography for all those fight scenes uh, that he gets himself involved it's in are, are really it's, excellent and here's what i particularly love is that the team they put together is exactly the kind of they cast him against type, but they cast the team against type. Mm. It's 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 Odin Kirk plus his his contact played by the RZA mm-hmm. plus his dad played by Christopher <laughs> Lloyd. Yeah. <laughs> now that's a really I mean you know I, I that's a fascinating group of people. Of course you know they all. Why would any of them turn that down? Odin Kirk gets to play an action star. 
Christopher Lloyd isn't being offered action star parts. You know, he's old. And the RZA is always down to blow something up. <laughs> so why why would any of them just turn that down? It's it's really terrific. I, I love this movie. I think I like it better than John Wick. Yeah, yeah. Michael Ironside walking around that movie. I would love anything Michael yeah. Ironside's walking around in. Uh, Godzilla versus uh, yeah, King Kong. Uh, yeah, you know, again, uh, this one. Look, I don't know. This, 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 this was big. Um, uh, Millie Bobby Brown running around this movie. Hall. I, I don't know, whatever. I, at this point, with, with the Godzilla and the King Kong movies, you know, they all started to look and sound and feel uh, kind of the same. Uh, yeah. They're all meant to be a part of this universe, you know, uh, that they're creating. I don't, it's not that I don't like it. It's just, look, you create, you, you create a situation here where you have what are basically two heroic characters. King Kong is a heroic character. Yeah. And Godzilla, at this point, is a heroic character. Uh, and they have to figure out a way to set them against each other and then to turn that around and to team them up and, and all of this kind of stuff. And I'm like, you know, it's the, the, the machinations is just too much, just too much going on here. Yeah. And, and CGI has just kind of jumped the shark in some ways. <laughs> sure. I kind of, there, there, it's just too much of it and they're having too much fun with it. And I don't know. It doesn't, you know, I, I'm not the audience for these, but you know, yeah. hey, again, movies anywhere, you get your movies anywhere code, knock yourself out. Uh, and the last 4K here is Final Fantasy VII <laughs> Advent Children. Um, uh, I just don't, I don't, I mean, the first Final Fantasy was not very good, and somehow we're up to seven yeah. of these things, and they're still not very good, but uh, I don't know. I guess somebody loves them. No, I, this, I don't. This, it, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of it. <laughs> I'm just yeah, stepping up because anyway. there was already a Final Fantasy VII anyway, right? There was a previous Final Fantasy I, VII. I can't. And, and this is like a it. remake of the seventh Final Fantasy. I don't know, yeah, and it's and 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 you know the, the there these are it's basically it's Japanese animation, but it's not anime because it's CG animation. Mm. So it's it's you know it really kind of lives in a different place. It's sort of um, ten, tangential to the world of anime. But uh, look, a lot of people love it. The games are popular. I guess the movies are are supposed to be a, a, an extension of the of the game verse. So whatever it is, yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. I I begrudge nobody enjoying those movies. I simply don't don't get it. But yeah. there you go. It's four K. Man, it looks it looks great. Well, that's true. Yeah. Uh, some uh, some new movies. Yeah. Why not? Uh, did you see Boogie by chance? Boogie. I don't think I saw that one. So Boogie, I kind of want to make a, 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 a quick little mention of Boogie because Boogie is kind of an important thing because um, Boogie, first of all, Boogie includes the the last fil- the screen performance of Pop Smoke before he was un- very sadly killed, the yeah. rapper Pop Smoke, yeah. who's very, very good in this. Um, but the, uh, the, the whole idea of Boogie is uh, the brainchild of Eddie Huang. And Eddie Huang, for those who don't know, Eddie Huang is kind of this amazing hyphenate. He's... <clears throat> a um, he, he Eddie Huang basically is, is the creator of Off the Boat or Fresh Off the Boat mm-hmm. TV show, but he's also a, a major restaurant figure in New York and kind of a, a more of a cultural icon. And the thing is that Eddie is a is a very street Asian guy. He is a very New York street guy who happens to be Asian. And there's an incongruity betw- about that that mm-hmm. he's got a lot of flack for, which is, oh, you're you're appropriating urban culture and all well, this yeah, kind of you're, 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 you're black culture, which is like yeah. just such bullshit, you know, yeah. uh, particularly for anybody who's been uh, to South Korea, who's been uh, yeah. uh, uh, to, you know, that's just, that, anyway, go on. I'm sorry, go ahead. And, and so this is basically Eddie's movie where he addresses that. And, and uh, this is about a guy who is basically, you know, Alfred Boogie Chin, who is a guy that represents sort of who he is or wanted to be. And um, uh, Boogie is, you know, he's, he's, he's Asian, but he's dreaming of being an NBA player. And he's really good at basketball. And he's very street. And he, you know, talks the talk. And he, and he, and he you know, he has a thing for this girl who happens to be black. And so that, that's an issue as well. And so it really, and then there's his rival. Pop Smoke plays his basketball rival. So it's really kind of a fascinating snapshot of this cross-cultural soup that Eddie Huang himself comes from. And he's trying to tell a story that reconciles all these elements that he's caught a lot of flack for to say, this is normal. This is New York. This is who these people are. And you can't expect them to sort of adhere to whatever 
you know, holes and, and diagrams that you, you want to culturally diagram for them. When you're born into New York, you're born into New York and you're going to be what you're going to be. And sort of it's, it's, it, I don't think the film is totally perfect in the way that it tries to tell that story. I think I just did a better job of it than the movie does. <laughs> um, but, but I get what he was going for. And uh, Taylor Takahashi, who plays Boogie, is really good. He's really good. And, you know, you don't necessarily like the guy. He's he's dislikable through a lot of this. He says things that are just totally inappropriate. The first thing that he says to uh, to Taylor Page, who plays his, his love interest in the film, is really misogynistic and insulting and, and offensive. And it's supposed to be, yeah. you know. Um, but I also want to put a shout out. Taylor Page is a wonderful actress. Oh, I'm I, I just I'm really just so nuts about Taylor Page. Oh, man. she is. Isn't she just wonderful? She's just she could do so much with so little. Um <laughs> And then there's also Siberia, the Abel Ferrara film with Willem Dafoe. Um, kind of a weird turn for Abel Ferrara. Uh, did you catch this, Tim? This was a grindstone release. I don't think I know that one. Uh, Abel and Willem hang out together in, in the movie world every, every now and again. And, and, yeah. it was, and the results are usually interesting. Yeah, they, this is this is I think maybe their third third something, film. Together. Something like that, yeah. Uh, something like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's kind of a, it's sort of a an out of the way. Uh, it's not a survivalist movie, but it's a, it's a movie about a loner. I guess maybe this is the way to do it. It's it's kind of a it's sort of a, a philosophical thriller about what it means to be alone, to be alienated from the world. Um, probably not the best way of outlining it, but. Uh, Defoe is very good in it. I just it feels a little bit undercooked, and I'm not sure that Ferrara really had uh, you know all of his ducks in a row when he made it. But it's not not bad. Abel used to be one of my favorite before. directors, man. Going King of New York, and you know, um, 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 uh, 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 Bad Lieutenant. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, even his even his um, uh, Body Snatchers movie. Uh, yeah. it's, 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 to, to, to my mind, I like his body snatchers movie. It's, it's certainly the most modern body snatchers movie of the, of the, of the, of the three or four that's been it done. It sure is. Yeah. And, uh, that's another one of my favorite can memories was when he, uh, that was the, that was 93. Yeah. Uh, I was there in 93. And I, I remember that's where he, he was in his element. He was thrilled. He thought he was going to be the next big Hollywood thing. And, uh, he uh, again. I apologize for long, long time listeners who've never heard these stories. But uh, <laughs> he he went up, he went up there, and uh, and we started making jokes about how, like, hey, you know, did you see they already gave uh, Jane Camp in the Palm Door? They gave it to her when she arrived at the airport because everyone knew the piano was going to win. Yeah. And it wound up co-winning with yeah. Farewell My Concubine, but everyone knew. And uh, and then Alexander Walker, the famous British uh, film critic, who's also a biographer of Stanley Kubrick's and a good friend of Kubrick's, um, Alexander Walker stands up and starts laying into Abel Ferrara for overlooking all the positive aspects of body snatching, that it makes people more sociable, it makes them more <laughs> friendly. It, it was like this weird, surreal <gasps> moment. I was sitting, I was sitting like 10 feet away and I looked at him I'm like, who the hell is this lunatic? And my friend Bruce from Canada, he goes, he goes that's Alexander Walker. I'm like, the Alexander Walker? Alexander Walker, the Kubrick Alexander Walker, is standing here making himself look like a lunatic ten feet from me. What the hell's going on? This is weird. Well, that's Ken, and uh, and Farrar just laughed at it until the next person stood up, some Danish or Dutch or something, and, and said, "I very much liked your body snatcher movie." And he goes, "Well, tell him that." <laughs> that was that was Abel Farrar. That was the high point. But I agree. I, I think that is a good one. Uh, any other uh, new movies in the list here that uh, that you want to focus on? Tim? Well, the Sound of Silence, of course. Um, um, oh uh, yeah, was uh, noted uh, this past awards season. Uh, um, uh, I, it, it, wait a minute, hold on. I'm thinking of a, a different movie. Give me a second here. All good. I'll make a note. Ah, I think I'll jump off at. Uh, uh, trigger Point, Barry Pepper. Uh, trigger Point, Trigger Point, Brad Turner's film with Barry Pepper, Comb, Fiori. Actually, a pretty good movie. Hadn't thought about Barry Pepper in a while. You know, Barry Pepper used to be sort of a fixture uh, in, in Hollywood movies, usually playing bad guys. My favorite Barry Pepper film is a uh, 25th Hour. Uh, Spike, Spike yeah, that's right. Uh, but you know, right. uh, here you know he's one of these special forces operative kind of guys, uh, and uh, he has to go out and do his thing. It's a pretty good movie. Uh, so far as these sort of uh, movies go, uh, uh, Jane Eastwood and a few other folks in it, Barry Pepper and uh, 
and uh, Trigger Point. Uh, I got, a, got a, a few here that I'll just go through real quickly. Omerta, the act of silence is uh is really you know it's an interesting little uh sort of low budget drama uh you know guy film crime film sort of uh kind of organized crime thing but um the uh what's really interesting about this to me is that it's it, despite the fact that it's just otherwise a totally negligible movie it has Joe Estevez in it. Yeah. Who, uh, it, it, you know, those who don't know, Joe Estevez is the brother of Martin Sheen. Obviously never had Martin's career, but looks a lot like Martin and actually appears in Apocalypse Now uncredited doing doubling work for Martin after Martin nearly killed himself with that whole little drunken mirror incident. Yeah. So um, what's funny is looking at Joe Estevez, who used to make a lot of kind of B-level action movies in, in the 90s, and you realize... He really, he's aged just like Martin. Yeah. Like he and Martin are really, they're, they're almost twins. It's, it's kind of weird. He's, he's become like that guy. Uh, and then there's also Tony Hale, the very funny and clever Tony Hale in Eat Wheaties, which is like, I, I thought I was going to hate this movie within the first 10 minutes. And I wound up really kind of liking it. This is this bizarre, uh, dark comedy about a really awkward, kind of messed up guy sort of an office drone not well connected doesn't have good social skills and he's called to be co-chair of his college reunion and and one of the people that he wants to bring in is elizabeth banks who, we, with, who he was friends with in college and so he kind of starts celebrity stalking her on social media not realizing that his public that his private comments to her are actually all public on her facebook page and when that go, goes public and blows up, it wrecks his life. And it's sort of, it's a really interesting look at how not being social media, media, social media savvy can yeah. be a problem, a liability. But it, it also takes some very dark turns about what is and isn't celebrity. And, you know, it's a really interesting movie, ultimately. So I didn't like the first 10 minutes of it I, until I kind of got the tone. Once you get the tone, it's a good movie. Mm. Uh, oh, oh, dude. Yeah. Uh, 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 this this uh, above suspicion. Is that one of the that's that's it's just the one that's that Philip Noyce above suspicion that, that, uh, that I'm thinking of? It, because it is just the one it's the one with Amelia Clark and Jack Houston. And it's it's interesting. I, I covered it on Film Week. It's interesting in, in 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 this way. It's not it's not a particularly fantastic movie, but the story is is, is interesting. It's the story that is, that is this that is this, you, this is the correct. This is yes. that film. It's, it's the exactly story the film. of yeah. uh, the first with Knoxville. With, with, yeah, with Johnny Knoxville sort of playing this sort of straight, sort of yeah. creepy, scary role, uh, and and Amila doing this, this sort of you know southern accent girl. It's all set in the early eighties, and it's the story of this FBI agent that Jack Houston is playing who. Uh, commits a murder, and he's the first FBI agent in history uh, to be, you know, eventually caught and captured and convicted of actually committing murder. Uh, and the no actual, kidding. and the actual guys in the film, it's, sort of, it's, it's, it's an interesting story. It's sort of backwater people doing all kinds of shady stuff, and she gets involved with him. He's married, and and uh, when he thinks it's all going to come out, he kills her. It's, it's a whole thing, but it's, but it's really uh, just an interesting story of this actual sort of historical event. And believe it or not, this happened like in the middle. I remember this story. So it was one of those stories that yeah, I think it made its way to like 60 minutes or something like that. Uh, it is, you know, it's, it's kind of a neat story and kind of a creepy movie. And, you know, good work on Johnny Knoxville's part. He really plays the hell out of this sort of backwater drug dealer guy. Uh, so, you know, yeah, above suspicion. Not, not bad at all that one. Uh, a totally weird Shudder movie here. Shudder comes up with some really out there horror stuff and, and, uh, thrillers. Anything for Jackson is like, uh, Rosemary's Baby in Reverse. <laughs> Here's what I mean by that. This is about a, a about this this couple who uh, an, an older couple who uh, cannot get over the fact that their grandson was killed. So they kidnap a pregnant woman and try to uh, basically channel their dead grandson's spirit into the body of the unborn child. Mm. That's the premise for anything for Jackson. So literally anything for Jackson. Uh, it is, it is really, really creepy. The premise is creepy. The execution is even creepier. And for Shudder, that is all good. Uh, <laughs> the, you're not going to recognize a lot of people in this. There's not a lot of names, but, uh, director Justin Dick 
D-Y-C-K, is, has some skills, and don't be surprised if he starts doing some pretty mm. big stuff soon. <laughs> sure. Bruce wow. Willis. Bruce Willis, Cosmic Sin. Uh, Frank, oh it's goodness. actually a Frank Grillo movie. Bruce is in it, uh, uh, one of these movies. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like when, you know, one of these solo big, big space adventures where you got these guys who are going to go out and, and, uh, and, and attack this planet, this alien civilization that's been discovered, and they're going to launch this preemptive sort of attack. But, hey, you know, uh, it's not terribly bad to force these things go. A lot of the fairly decent CGI sort of executed and the uh, uh, special effects are pretty good. Um, uh, you know, and Bruce, uh, you know, he's in there for as long as he's in there doing his thing. It's really Frank Grillo's movie. And Frank is kind of like taking it up a notch with all, all, all of these things. I'm you know? glad that Frank's career at this point, Frank's been around for what, 35, 40 years? Yeah. I mean, he's been around a long time. Yeah, yeah. Since the 80s. Yeah. Frank was doing stuff in the 80s. I'm so glad to see his career finally, finally land, you know, in a place where, where it, he's not just like some henchman in the background being a bad guy. I mean, he's, he's doing some interesting work. He's mm-hmm. getting a star in movies. It's good. Yeah, Frank, Real. go. Go for it, Frank. Uh, we get Resurrection, which is uh, from Roma Downey and Mark Burnett, kind of continuing their series of, of Bible miniseries and Bible movies. Um, this takes place, you know, after Jesus' resurrection, and uh, it's all about the persecution of Christians in in the wake of uh, of of that. This is t- this comes from AD. The Bible continues. I mean, it's it's fine. It's not the budget that it should have. It's not done with the uh, with the same. I mean, you know, if if you saw their productions of uh, of the Bible and AD, the Bible continues, and Son of God, and all the stuff, and the recuts and multiple cuts of the things they've been doing. It's very much in the same vein of all that, but uh, you know, it's it has its audience, and I'm not gonna not gonna slight them. I, I I love Jesus movies as much as anybody. I just wish the production value was better. No, nah, it happens. French exit. Uh, you know, look, I always enjoy uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. I don't think she works nearly as much as as, as I wish she would. Uh, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, as she as she uh, you know moves on on to the sort of back half of her career. And French exit was she was a lot of fun in this movie. Uh, playing this sort of like socialite, this this inheritance queen. She she had some dough. She's just about spent it all. Uh, she moves to Paris to live in this apartment with her son, uh, and a cat. Uh, and she's kind of a pain in the ass, <laughs> and uh, and has to sort of reconcile uh, what her life has sort of come around to. Uh, Lucas Hedges in it. Tracy Letts, when he's not writing plays, is an actor, and he's in this movie. Uh, and it's you know, and I, I think a lot of folks were, were were looking at this for some award season love last year. It's not that kind of a movie. It's not it's not like an award season sort of movie, but it's a perfectly lovely film and the exact kind of movie uh, that Michelle Pfeiffer uh, should be wandering around in. Uh, being really charming and funny and sort of playing against her sort of type and character uh, the way she does in this movie. French Exit, it was pretty good. I, I rather enjoyed it. The Zeal Jacobs I, film. As the, uh, yeah, I, I, I concur with that. Uh, we've also got uh, another DC Universe movie, Batman The Long Halloween Part ooh. 1. So uh, does it make me want to see Part 2? Uh, yeah, kind of, maybe. You know, if I have time, I'm not uh, overwhelmingly into it. But uh, these these movies do have some some fun twists and turns to them. I, I like the I like the way they're written, if not the necessarily the way they're animated, and uh, uh, you know the uh, the the integration of the Falcone crime family in this thing is 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 a nice little uh, a, a nice little unexpected twist because we expect you know obviously uh, Solomon Grundy and and Catwoman and joker and all the rest of them but uh yeah it's uh it, it's it's good um why not i guess why not yeah sure that a recommendation uh you know i, I want to put a real quick shout out to to some stuff from um before i forget about it from uh classic flicks f-l-i-x you can go and uh, check them out at classicflix.com f-l-i-x um, they've got some great new releases from uh, their uh, Silver series. This is all DVD, not Blu-ray. But The Duke of West Point, starring Hayward and Fontaine, uh, meaning Joan Fontaine. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, S- uh, Streamliners Collection, Volume 6, The Curly Comedies, uh, with um, some amazingly adorable kids, uh, like you know Larry Olson and uh, Eileen Jansen. I mean, it's fun stuff and then the one that i like the most is uh the crystal ball with paulette goddard and ray Milland, which i i think is a is a really wonderful discovery from 1943 if you haven't seen it 
Um, this thing has a fascinating history, and it winds up being an absolutely delightful film. Paulette Goddard, uh, Paulette Goddard, Goddard it, of course, at one point was you know uh, uh, with Chaplin, mm. and uh, you know just an amazing actress, amazing career. Ray Milland, of course, can do no wrong. It's really uh, it's a it's a it's a pretty great romantic comedy that kind of falls between the cracks because you don't normally think of that you don't associate Ray Milland with romantic comedies. No, no, it's, that's a good one. The Crystal Ball, Crystal yeah. Ball from 1943. So. There you go. Little William Bindix in that film. I always love that one. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's see. What else do we have here with, uh, with, with the, with new movies? Is there anything else that just jumps out or should we dive into some TV? Well, uh, let's look. Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to say, I don't know if you, if, if you want to talk about some of the arrows. Uh, oh, we can do the arrows for sure. Let's do the arrows. Because yeah, I see, yeah. I, because I see your Azumi for one thing. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and what a beautiful, beautiful movie. Uh, uh, you know, about a young woman who gets kidnapped and, and into prostitution. It's just, it's a spider, this beautiful spider tattoo on her back. Anyway, uh, it's just an absolutely exquisite film from 1966. So, so, uh, what is that? Is that Blu ray? Is that DVD? What do we get? That is Blu ray. That is Blu ray with loads and loads and loads of extras on Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, all the, all the, all the arrows. They're like, they're like criterions, you know, they just, they just pile them up with these extras and documentaries and interviews and everything else. Yeah. And which is, which, yeah, it resume. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's it, they they load this up. It's got uh, you know, it's got the um, a new audio commentary with uh, Japanese cinema scholar David Desser. It's got an introduction by uh, Tony Raines, who does a lot of these kinds of things, and this really, really super cool visual essay by Daisuke Miya, which is really just uh, just absolutely beautiful. So, no, this is a very this is a very nice set. Hmm. Is that the 1966 Django? Uh, that's the, that I see there. Oh, Django! Yeah, baby, that's the original Django. So, so you know, it, 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 the original Django, 4K <laughs> in 4K. So here's the thing. Here's the story on this. Uh, there's a little bit of drama here. This was originally supposed to be released to Blu-ray in this nice, fancy, splashy set in May of last year. Uh, and I got, it was like pre-pandemic when I got it originally, I think. And um, then there, there, there follows up this email saying, don't review it. We're pulling it. It's not going to be released. I'm like, why the hell not? This is a great set. Mm. You kidding me? This is Django. Come on. You, you like, you know, I, I was set to, to include it on the show. I was going to email you all this stuff. And, and, and they're like, no, don't do it. And I've emailed them repeatedly over the last year. You got a new release date for Django? No. <laughs> Django back on the, is Django back on the schedule? No. When, where's Django? We'll let you know. It was all very kind of, you know, finally. It's 4K. That's, that was the deal. They did it in 4K and it's absolutely terrific. What it's the hell were they, the were they, were they, were they? I don't know. They were being very secretive, but it looks great. Sergio Corbucci's, uh, Franco Nero Django. We love Django. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, this thing is just piled with extras on it. I mean, it's a, it's got interviews galore, including like with a uh, stuntman and actor Gilberto, uh, uh, Gal, Gal, um, however you pronounce his last name. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, no, it's, it's really great. I mean, anything and everything you need to know about Django and spaghetti Westerns is, is here. It's, it's pretty great. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. 4k Django. Yeah, Can't go good. wrong there. 4k Django. You cannot, uh, Arrow also gave us, uh, years of lead to five classic Italian crime thrillers made between 1973 and 1977. Um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Italian crime thrillers of that period. They're a little tiny bit cheesy for my taste, but, um, this is like a, a, a there's an actual genre. That's a big deal in Japan from this period. It's like called Polizio. Teshi or Polizia Teshi or something like that, mm. but it describes this particular. It's like giallo, right? Mm. Um, mm. You know, it's a, it's a it's a genre that was a very very specific kind of film in a specific part of Italian cinema. Uh, you know, I mean, if you like these kinds of films, it's 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 a uh, you know, go for it. I mean, <clears throat> not necessarily my films, uh, but they're they are what they are. Uh, you've got uh, Savage Three, like Rabid Dogs. Um, Cult 38 Special Squad, Highway Racer, uh, and Happily Resolved. These mm. are the movies. So, uh, you know, they're they're not my favorites, but, um, you know, uh, I'm sure somebody out there is just drooling over that. Right well, now. you know, The Stylist, uh, you, which is which is a more contemporary film, uh, but sort of yeah. falls into that whole sort of genre style or, or, or type in any case. Uh, yeah. About a hairstylist who becomes you know, sort of obsessed with this girl. So it lives in the same space as those. Um, what was that Hitchcock film? Frenzy, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Kind of lives in that space. These, these yeah. movies kind of. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then we got uh, got a couple other here. Death has blue eyes by Nico Masterakis, which is a which is a fun kind of exploitationy, um, you know, feminist. Uh, it's not quite in the I spit on your grave territory, but mm. it's it's sort of there. Uh, it's got a little bit of uh, you know ghost story edge to it. Um, you know, it's a little giallo y. It's, it sort of crosses all of those genres. Um, it's, it's worth checking out. If you know Nico Masterakis as a filmmaker, you, yeah. you know exactly what to expect. They're all kind of the same. Uh, the one of these arrows that I'm really, really uh, fond of is the uh, Park Chan Wook, or Park Chan Wook, I'm told is the correct pronunciation. Mm. His film JSA for Joint Security Area. Um, Park is the, uh, is the, the amazing director of, gosh, I mean, so many phenomenal really uh, difficult to watch korean films um uh, old boy being probably the most famous of them yeah. uh but but uh you know his movies are really difficult to watch uh you know uh, like or or um uh audition yeah audition, audition. they're intense right. man audition yeah. they're intense they're all intense anyway this uh this actually won some awards it's not quite as intense as those others but because uh, it's a war film but it, uh, it it's based on kind of a a uh, a North South Korea mm. uh, war premise or skirmish along the demilitarized zone, and um, it, it uses that as kind of a metaphor for a whole lot of re- very disturbing observations about human nature, and you know uh, it, it gets really creepily procedural too. Mm. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a good film, but you got to know what you're getting into with Park Chan Wook. Oh yeah, you got to know. Lots of extras here too. Uh, all right, Tim. Uh, where else? Uh, we got maybe like two minutes left. Any anything in particular? Well, you're you're asking about some TV, and I see I see that there's the the Doctor Who Black Guardian uh, trilogy, oh, yeah. and I'm just dying to know what the hell is in that <laughs> because you know me and my Doctor Who sort of situation. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. so what is a part? What is what is what is, what is just Black Guardian trilogy? Other than the Black Guardian trilogy is from the Peter Davison year. Ah, yes, I yes. remember that. Peter used to wear the whole sort of like tennis outfit the blonde yes uh yes. About, about what would it be the fifth or sixth doctor i think is is, is what he is of, the, of, like the, of the old era okay he's uh, the one that always looked like he was getting ready for tennis and yeah Wimbledon. exactly yeah that's how he dressed with the yeah he, he dressed like he was going to play tennis yeah the that sixth, white sweater the sixth that, white so that's sweater. that period okay i remember that yes so it's rather amazing uh these it's 12 episodes and each four set of four episodes represents like a single movie per se so a single that's what they mean by the trilogy there's modern undead which is uh, four episodes and then terminus another four episodes and then enlightenment another four episodes so it's uh story numbers 126 27 and 28 for those that like to keep track in mm. a really really nerdy way but <laughs> yeah i i kind of you know i i didn't appreciate davison as much as i i then as much as i do now i uh he, he he was not a bad who. Well, yeah, you know he was he, he was he was uh, w- one of the first straightforward uh, Doctor Who's. He, you know yeah. he 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 played it kind of straight. He wasn't particularly eccentric. Eccentric. He wasn't old. He wasn't uh, foppish. He wasn't uh, you, you, otherwise insane like Sylvester McCoy or some others. You know he was just sort of like this guy, and he looked like he was uh, on his way to Wimbledon. <laughs> and Wimbledon, and uh, and uh, you know, it, it, it with a with kind of a, a normal haircut and and uh, and demeanor. So he was interesting. So I would say he was the prototype for the latter doctors uh, who would come along in the in, in the new series. Point. That's <laughs> who, a great point. Who all engaged it more from that um, from the you know a more straightforward a, sort of standpoint. Yeah, that's a great point. He really did kind of prototype it for everything that's come since. Yep. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, let, let me make a real quick uh, shout out Billions season two. Ooh. I don't get this show. I don't get it. <laughs> me neither. Show. Do you like Billions? No, but there's no, there's nothing to like in Billions. Everybody's awful. Uh, they're all terrible people. But but clearly, if either of them ever wins, the show is over. Yeah. So there's no. This is just a cat and mouse game in which the the, the mouse and the cat. It's just the, well, just, the very rich gone. mouse and the very rich cat watching the rich people kick each other. It's not, yeah, you know, and and generally it's the fallout. Uh, everybody else catches the fallout. The rich people. They're at the end of at, at the end of each episode. They're still rich. So, so, so and, I don't and, care. And nobody has won. And nobody's nobody's won. won. Nobody can. And, yeah, it's ridiculous. I don't get it. You know, if they did, if they did like they do on Ozark, where you go, holy crap, you just killed a major character. 
Holy crap, what are you doing? Why would you do that? Well, on, on, on Ozark, all these people are just one bad decision from either being uh, bankrupt <laughs> or dead, you know. But that can't happen and, and because no. they can't actually kill each other. So, you know, there's, 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 no, that's uh, there's, there's no, no. And we are a full decade uh, into this uh, horrible zombie wasteland oh, now with wow. the new Walking Dead series, World Beyond. Yeah. Uh, in its first season on AMC, I I wonder how much more mileage they can squeeze out of this. Well, they're not getting very much miles out of that one. It's it's the least popular uh, yeah. of all of the new New Walking Dead incarnations uh, thus far. I think folks are, uh, and, I, and, I, and, yeah. I, and I don't think it's because it's not good. I yeah. just think it's the, the idea is worn out. Oh yeah, we, I mean this is well done. I watch I watched a few episodes. And I'm like, okay. Oh well, I, well I, Julia Ormond is in the you know, you know I mean yeah. you can't, you can't. it's not it's not bad. It's just I've been there, done that. And I was never a huge fan. You know, I'd, I'd catch an episode now and again, but um, yeah, it's just got to been there, done that feel. But anyway, I mean, it is nicely done if you if you if you're not burned out by now. Yeah. All right, that should that should do it. Uh, we are at the end, Tim. Um, let's. Uh, what's your what's your uh, summer like? I'm gonna be. I think we'll, we might get one more podcast out of the way, and then I'm on vacation for two weeks oh. out of town. Uh, are you heading out of town at any point? I am going to go. I'm going to go to back to St. Louis uh, end of July for a couple of, for a couple of few days. Uh, right. So you know, uh, you know, hang out, hang around with my mom uh, for some things. One one good thing about about the uh, about the pandemic, it's it, it's made me realize I can go anywhere and be anywhere and do whatever I'm doing wherever I'm at. Uh, yeah, you know, I agree. That, that's and I kind of I kind of enjoy that a little bit. So so that uh, and then I think I got a couple of appearances on Film Week. And then we, of course, are going to start our whole little new thing, that little Godcast situation. Yes, we've got it. We've got a new kind of a video podcast uh, thing that we're going to be putting together. We'll we'll uh, post that on the uh, on the, the it'll, it'll be to the Cine God site and we'll make mention of it uh, probably on the next podcast. I think we'll have it under our belt at that point. And um, we'll certainly make mention of it on the social media pages as well. The, the, the Godcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, well, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll pick subjects, we'll talk about them, we'll have yeah. a guest uh, occasionally, and um, the, yeah. you know, just sort of rant and rave about, you know, the stuff. That Whatever we, uh, it is. Yeah, all the stuff that we usually rant and rave about at the top of this <laughs> <Right>. show, <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll take that and squeeze it into a show of its own. <laughs> Uh, and then, um, so yeah, so we'll try to get one more of these podcasts under our belt uh, before vacation time, and then I think we'll probably then uh, we'll we'll reconnect beginning of August. Sounds good. All right, everybody, have a great great time, and uh, be safe out there as we all get back to life as normal. Hopefully, be well.